our message this morning. And so over the last couple of weeks, we've been going through a series called Empty. And today is going to culminate with talking about how we find our fulfillment not in the things of this world, but actually we find our fulfillment in what ended up being an empty tomb. We're going to look at that concept, and we're going to work our way through how, this longing that we have in our lives. But we've been looking at this concept of emptiness, and the concept of how people in their desire to fulfill their emptiness actually led to Jesus' crucifixion, because people were trying to find fulfillment in all kinds of other ways outside of Jesus as the Messiah and Lord of their life. And so over the past two weeks, we've looked at three different stories of Individuals who played a different role in the execution of Jesus. And, and hopefully you, you've seen, if you've been here, if not, I'm going to do a quick recap about them of the role that they've played. And our theme verse throughout this series has come from Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. And it says that they fell captive to the philosophies, to the empty deceits, and the human traditions according to the elemental spirits of this world and not to Christ. They became captive to the things of this world, the material things, the temporal things of this world, and not to the things of Christ, not to the teaching of Christ, not to a relationship with Christ. And so the Pharisees, and they're the first group we looked at. So if you remember a couple weeks ago, Pastor Laura started it off with an illustration about how when sin came into the world, it, it, our life is represented in this picture. When sin came into the world, it broke the picture. We, we became empty because we no longer had fulfillment through a relationship with God because sin separated us. It caused a gap. It caused a chasm in our lives, and there was a longing for more. And, and we could try and fill our life with all kinds of different things, but no matter what we do, because of sin in our lives, it's going to find its way out. We can't, we can't fill it up because the sin and the brokenness that's in our lives. So the Pharisees, they tried to fill it up with tradition, with Perfectionism. They tried to fill it up with rules and living the perfect life and looking perfect, but it didn't work. And then next we moved on to Judas, and, and he tried to find fulfillment through greed, through, through monetary things, through having value, you know, m monetary value, but, but that didn't fill his life up either. He, he took the 30 pieces of silver, but as quick as he got the 30 pieces of silver, as soon as he turned Judas o or Jesus over to, to the soldiers, what did he do? He went back and he threw the silver back at their feet, and we know it says he took his own life in regret of the decision that he had made. And last week we looked at, at the role of Pilate, and Pilate in his life, Pilate was the one who had the ability to put Jesus to death, right? The Pharisees, they did not have the authority to be able to execute anyone. They were just a religious court. They were religious leaders. They didn't have any uh, authority as far as governmental authority. And so they brought Jesus before Pilate, and over and over again, he tried to find different ways to, to rid himself of Jesus, to not have to make a decision, but eventually he gave himself over to the crowd, and he allowed the crowd to, to cause him to, to go with what he knew he wasn't supposed to do. Over and over again, Pilate, four or five different times, tried to hand Jesus off to somebody else. He tried to pass the buck and say, no, it's not me. You, you guys charge him. And they said, we don't have the ability to put him to death. And then he sent him back uh, to Herod. And Herod said, he's not my problem, he's yours. And he sent him back. And, and, then, and then Pilate said, well, okay, I've got another idea. We have a tradition where we release a criminal every year on the Passover. I'll present them with the opportunity to, to keep Barabbas, who is a violent criminal, in prison, and they'll let Jesus go. And the crowd said, no, 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 give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. And then finally, he, he, with one last ditch effort, Pilate sat there and he goes, after having a conversation with him, and again, he, he goes, well, maybe if I beat him, that'll be enough. But the crowd wasn't appeased, and he didn't find fulfillment in that, because the crowd was still ch chanting all the more, crucify him, crucify him, and eventually, Pilate gave way to the crowd, and he allowed the crowd to sway him because he was empty. He was trying to find fulfillment in the wrong things. Brad, if I could have you help me fill this back up. I don't need it right away. It's for a little bit later. But we look at this concept of how we try to find fulfillment in all kinds of different things in this world. And there's examples in, in, in Scripture that show us what that looks like. 
So the Pharisees, again, it was behavior, it was perfectionism, it was the law, but it left them empty. For Jude, Judas, it was money and it was greed, but the approval that he was looking for, it, it didn't bring him any type of fulfillment. And Pilate, he wanted the approval of the crowd. He thought, well, if I can make the popular decision, if I can get the people behind me, that'll be good. And the crowd wasn't willing to go with him. And so he decided to go against what he knew was right and put Jesus up for crucifixion. But the great irony in all of these situations, in each of these stories, from the Pharisees to Judas to Pilate, is this. They were trying to seek to fill an emptiness in their lives. When in, in fact, they actually came face to face with that who would bring fulfillment to the emptiness they had in their lives. Each of them encountered Jesus face to face. They had an opportunity to talk to him. They had an opportunity to see him, to get to know him. But even with him right before them, even with having conversations with him, they did not understand or accept who he was, the only one who could actually fill them and bring fulfillment into their lives. They were preoccupied with traditions, greed, popularity, that they couldn't see who he truly was. Their eyes were blinded. Instead of seeing Jesus as an answer, they saw him as the problem, and they said, we know the solution. The solution is the cross. The solution is to get rid of him. If he's not here anymore, he's not a problem anymore. We won't have to worry about people following him. We won't have to worry about this crowd that has begun to come behind him and support him. And, and, and they won't have to see any more of the signs and wonders that he's performing of raising the dead and healing the sick and delivering those of demonic possession. They said it's an easy solution. Just get rid of him. Put him on the cross. We'll put him in a tomb and it'll be over with. Jesus was brutally beaten, and then he was nailed to the cross, where he hung and died. He was buried in a borrowed tomb for three days, as we sang about this morning. A large stone was rolled in front of it, and soldiers were posted outside as guards. And for three days, his body lay there in the tomb, silent, still, and without light. His followers were left in utter darkness, feeling empty, confused. Scared, denying him, running away, trying to seek safety in other places. It was the darkness, it's in the darkness that we read of a woman who made her way to Jesus' tomb to properly prepare his body for burial. We're going to be in John chapter 20 this morning, so if you have your Bibles, feel free to open them up in John chapter 20 or your Bible app on your phone. As always, the scriptures will be on the screen behind me as well. I know some of you look. The screen turned black on purpose. That was intentional. I know I had a few looks of like, projector? No, oh, yeah. That was intentional. The, the scriptures will be up there. But in John chapter 20, we start reading the very first verse. It says this. Now on the first day of the week, Sunday, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. And she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and she went to Simon Peter and the other disciple the one whom Jesus loved, referring to John. And he said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Right? So Mary approaches the tomb. She's going there to give him the proper burial that, that he deserved. But when she gets there, what does she find? An empty tomb. The stones roll away. His body is no longer there. Again, throughout this entire series, we have been seeing people seeking fulfillment but only ending up feeling as empty or even more empty than they did before they, said they were seeking fulfillment in the different things of this world. Now Mary, she's coming, she's anticipating that the stone is going to be there, that the tomb is going to still be full, that Jesus' body will still be there. But instead of finding what she thought would be full, she found something that was empty. And it seems that Mary might know a thing or two about emptiness. Because if you know a little bit about Mary's story, a little bit of context about Mary Magdalene and who she is. And so just to clarify, this is not Mary, the mother of Jesus. This is Mary Magdalene, another woman who I'm going to explain a little bit of her story here, who was one of, who followed Jesus. The Bible tells us that she understood emptiness because at one point in Mary's life, Mary suffered from demon possession in her life. 
The Bible tells us that Jesus cast seven demons out from Mary. You can read about it in Mark chapter 16 or Luke chapter 8. We aren't given the details of how or why she became possessed with these demons. Maybe she was, she too was seeking to find fulfillment in the wrong way or in the wrong places, and she opened herself up to that. We don't know. It doesn't give us the details. Maybe it was something completely out of her control and not a result of her choices, but Mary must have known what it felt like to be empty because in her life she had been empty before. When Luke recounts the story, he noted that Mary was not alone on her way to the tomb, but that she went with at least two other women, one named Joanna and the other being Mary, the mother of James, or Mary, the mother of Jesus, was present there. So we know there was at least three ladies, it says in Luke chapter 24, that were there that morning to prepare Jesus' body for its proper burial. And as they walked, they probably were mourning the loss of of their friend, of their, their leader, of their son. They were probably reeling from the brutal acts they had just seen the previous days. Right? They went from on Friday celebrating with him, or on, on Thursday celebrating with him, and, and enjoying the Passover, and enjoying communion together, to his arrest Thursday night, and Friday his, his, his trial before Pilate, and watching him being beaten to a pulp. It says he was beaten nearly to the point of death. Basically, one last war would have probably killed Jesus. That's the point that they beat him to, and that still didn't satisfy the crowd. But they had just witnessed all this. They had seen his body be mutilated. They had seen him be put upon a cross. They had seen him stabbed in the side as he was up there upon the cross, and they had heard him say, It is finished, and darkness came upon the whole world. They had witnessed all of that. We don't know if they were crying as they walked up there. We don't know if they were in absolute silence. Again, it doesn't give us the details. Maybe they were sharing memories about their time with Jesus. Did they speak of the confusion of his loss? Were they angry with the people that were responsible for his death? Whether you could look at the Romans or the, the Pharisees and religious leaders that turned him over to the Romans. It doesn't give us any of those details in Scripture. But it says that when they finally made it to the tomb, they found it empty. It was empty. So they ran back to tell the disciples, and then Peter and John ran to the tomb to see for themselves because they didn't believe the ladies. They were in disbelief. They didn't believe them, and so they ran to go check themselves. And of the three women, it says that we know that at least Mary Magdalene went back with them. The others may have, but we know that for sure Mary Magdalene went back with them the two gentlemen, to the tomb to see. The disciples went into the tomb, they saw that it was empty, and then they went away dumbfounded. Then they went back to the rest of the disciples. But it says Mary stayed there. Peter and John left, but Mary stayed. Why did she stay? Did, did Mary maybe know that there was more going on than what was plain to the eye? Was she still hoping that Maybe it wasn't just that Jesus' body had been taken, but maybe, in fact, he had risen from the dead. Or was it because she was hurting and she didn't know what to do, and so she was there mourning and grieving? Maybe she found herself once again searching for the fulfillment that she had only found in Jesus through her time with him. All we know is that it says she stayed there. It says the other two left and she stayed. We pick it up a few verses later in John chapter 20, starting at verse 11. We read, But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been laid, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Why are you weeping? My Lord's gone, and I don't know where they've taken his body. Keep reading. It says, having said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing, but she, didn't, she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? So a second time she's asked this question, but then he asked her this part. Whom are you 
seeking? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and she said back to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means rabbi, or my God. As soon as he said her name, she knew exactly who he was. That feeling of emptiness was immediately filled with fulfillment because she knew that was Jesus standing there next to her. But I want you to imagine for a moment the roller coaster of emotions that Mary must have been going through that day. Not just that day. Again, go back to just what the last three, four days entailed. But now this morning, what she's going through. She was overwhelmed, I'm sure, with sadness and grief and mourning on her way to the tomb. Then when she arrived, she was overwhelmed with confusion of where is he? What have they done with him? Where is my Lord? She probably had frustration because she was trying to get the disciples to believe her and they weren't believing her. They had to go look for themselves. And then she was probably sad all over again because then it says that she looked into the tomb and the angels were there and they said, why are you weeping? She said, because my Lord is not here. Or just think about the, the roller coaster of it all. The ups, the downs, the struggles, the challenges. And then finally again, you talk about going up the highest of high mountains on a roller coaster. That emotion that unimaginable joy that she must have felt when he said Mary and she turned around and she realized she was standing before him once again. That he was there in person, alive, in front of her. That he had beaten death just as he told them he it's interesting that at first it says Mary didn't recognize him, right? She thought he was probably the gardener, right? Well, there's a few people wondering, well, why that? Well, first of all, Jesus is probably the last person she ever imagined she was going to see that day at the tomb in the garden, right? She was thinking, there's a lot of people I'm going to see. I'm going to see soldiers when I get there. I'm going to see the dead body of Jesus. And she had the other ladies with her. And, but she was not imagining that Jesus was going to be someone she was going to physically encounter standing next to her, talking to her, calling her by her name. So we don't, we don't know exactly why, but that's probably one of the big reasons why, because she just was not expecting to see him. The other side is maybe, maybe he was unrecognizable in his resurrected body. Because the last thing that they had seen of Jesus was his body brutally beaten and torn to bits. And now his body was whole. It was healed. Once again, maybe that was part of the reason why but when Jesus said Mary's name, she immediately recognized him. It's proven that the, the most powerful thing that we can do to another person that will give them the biggest, uh, the, spike, the biggest spike of brain activity is to call them by their name. That is the greatest thing that we can do to one another is calling each other by our name, by their name. That's how God wired us. And that's what happened with Mary here. She immediately knew who he was. It was the same man who had said her name after he released the demonic's possession off of her. It was the same man who had fixed her soul and through his life and his death and his resurrection was now being transformed. It was the same man that when she walked in emptiness, she was able to find fulfillment because of who he is as the Messiah. It was Jesus. That he had beaten death. It's also worth pointing out that at first, Mary, as I said, he mistook Jesus for the gardener. And I want to I just talk about that little part. What, why did John include that? Why did John include the fact that he thought, maybe Mary thought Jesus was a gardener? Well, maybe here's one reason why John, you know, the Holy Spirit inspired John to include that in his gospel. Because it can change our perspective of the setting when we think about what happened that morning. It's no longer a graveyard. It's now become a garden. It's no longer a place of death. It's now a place of 
life. And at the mention of a garden, John's original readers, the Jewish audience, would have immediately gone back to where? They would have gone back to the Garden of Eden. They would have immediately gone back to where sin first entered the world. And that was in the garden. When Adam and Eve sinned. When the first two humans created. And they were dwelled with God. And they had a perfect relationship with him. That was whole and it was complete. There was no emptiness. There was no seeking fulfillment. Because they had the full, uh, they had full relationship with God. But then sin came and as a punishment, death entered our world. And sin and separation came. And Adam and Eve had to leave the Garden of Eden. A rift that was created between humanity and God. Adam and Eve turned what was a beautiful garden into a graveyard. And now we see in this story, now we see a graveyard that's being turned into a beautiful garden. So the Garden of Eden is where the problems of emptiness began. It's where sin came into our world. It's where sin began to create separation between us and God. And where sin began to just cause us to have emptiness and a longing for more, a seeking of fulfillment and different things in our lives. Sin wreaked, sin ravaged all kinds of trouble on our lives. And we've been seeking ever since that moment in the garden to find fulfillment again. To find the perfect way to deal with the sins in our world and the sins of our life. And for thousands of years before Jesus came, they were still searching. They were still looking for a way to fill that emptiness and that void, to satisfy that longing they had to know something greater than just the things of this world and what this world could offer. And it's in a moment like that that we see Jesus come. This desire we have for a creator is quenched. Because of our sin and rebellion, again, there's that rift between us and God. Sin puts you and I into the graveyard. As sinners, as those who are lost without the Lord in our lives, we are walking around in a literal, spiritual graveyard in death. But through Him, we're able to find new life. And we're able to walk out of the graveyard and into the garden, into new life of Christ. John communicated all of this, pointing out how Mary mistook Jesus for a garden. And she was surrounded by death. She was surrounded by hopelessness. And then Jesus appeared. And what happens when Jesus appears? Life, hope, appears in our lives. He was the one who defeated death, the one who died for our sins. Jesus' death provided a bridge between the rift that was present between humanity and mankind, or between humanity and God, because sin had created this gap between us. His death and his resurrection, it mends the holes of our soul. It mends the brokenness. It helps to fill the emptiness that we have in our lives. And we allow our lives to be filled with Jesus. He fills it and he plugs those gaps and it begins to allow our lives to be filled. The tape didn't work perfectly. <laughs> but you understand the concept that through Jesus, we are able to, I'll just set it down now and stop leaking out. But through Jesus, he fills the holes. He mends the brokenness in our lives. He removes the gap that sin created in our lives lives. Jesus' sacrifice repairs the damage that was done in the garden for sin. Humans have a habit of turning graves or gardens into graves, but there is one who can turn every grave into a garden, and that is Jesus Christ. Mary had come feeling empty, and she was seeking a full tomb that day. She left finding an empty tomb and feeling full that day. After Jesus appeared to her, she ran back to tell the other disciples that Jesus had defeated death and that she had seen the Lord herself. Next we read that the disciples had gathered together behind locked doors. They were in a house. They were afraid that the same people who killed Jesus might eventually come and try to take their own lives. So they're hiding away inside a locked house. And who appears? None other than Jesus who just all of a sudden right there in the middle of the house. Not a door open, not a window open. Jesus just brought himself right into the house. 
I'm sure at first the disciples were probably a little bit freaked out trying to figure out, how did he get here? Is that Jesus? What's going on right now? And after they calmed down and Jesus had calmed them and helped them, he showed them, he said, look at the marks and my arms and my feet. You can feel them if you want to. He showed them and it's me. And in John 20, verse 21, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Jesus breathed on them, it says. Which sometimes we look at that and we think, well, that might be a little strange. What does that mean? But again, go back to the garden. How did God bring about life? It says that he, he molded him out of the dust of the earth. And then it says that God breathed life into Adam. Why? Because he put himself into Adam. He breathed life into him. And in the same way that he breathed life into Adam, and he, Jesus is breathing upon his disciples, and he's saying, receive the Holy Spirit. And he's breathing it on them. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit began to fill them. And we see a little bit later on the day of Pentecost where the Holy Spirit falls in its fullness. But the picture has been repaired. Our lives have been repaired. The holes have been filled. We find wholeness because there's a God who offers a solution. Maybe right now this morning, for you, wherever you may be, maybe your life feels lonely. Know that God desires to have a relationship with you. Maybe you're struggling with this gnawing sensation that there has to be more to life than this. There has to be more than this. I have a longing, I have a desire for more than this. What is it? Know that Jesus is a longing that you're desiring. And if you go after Jesus, I can guarantee you will long no more for the things of this world because he will satisfy the longings that you have. Amen. We can only be fixed. We can only be transformed. We can only be made whole by relationship with Jesus Christ. This comes by giving our sins over to him, by surrendering our lives to him, and by allowing his spirit to fill you again. God has gone to great lengths to be with you and I and all of us to fill our emptiness. He provided a solution for all of the sins that have left us feeling empty through the sacrifice of his son Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection from the dead three days later. He provides you with a full life here and now on earth, and he's going to provide you with a full eternal life with him in heaven. Why? Because he loves you. Because he wants to take your life that may appear to be a graveyard right now, and it may feel empty. And he wants to turn it into a garden that's full of life, that's full of hope, and that's full of fulfillment with him. So as the worship team comes back up this morning, I've got a question for you. Maybe you're in that spot this morning where you don't have a relationship with him. Maybe your life feels like it's a, a barren graveyard. This morning, maybe you're ready to take your life and you're ready to surrender to him and allow Jesus to transform your life from being a graveyard into a garden and finding life through him again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply just offer an opportunity this morning with every head bowed and every eye closed. This morning, if you're in here today, you're joining us online, you can reach out to us but and you want to make a decision today to say, you know what, I'm ready to surrender my heart to Jesus. I want to give my life to him. I've been seeking this world. I've been seeking fulfillment and trying to fill myself and find satisfaction in things in this world. But nothing is working. I, and I'm longing for more. And today you're ready to say, Jesus, I want you to bring fulfillment. I want to surrender to you so that my life can be fulfilled. I can find satisfaction through you because of your life, your death. In your resurrection. So again this morning, with no one looking around, this is between you and the Lord this morning. If you want to make that decision this morning to surrender your heart to Him, I want to encourage you to just put your hand up in the air and you can put it right back down. And this morning, if that's where you're at in your life and you're ready to say, today, I want to live a life that's fulfilled. A life 
where I understand what God is calling me to do. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You may put your hands down. I want to encourage those that responded this morning and those that have made this decision before in your life, would you please repeat after me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending Jesus to this earth to be the perfect sacrifice to make a way to pay for my sins so that I can be brought back together with you again. I surrender my life. I turn from my sins and I run after you with all that I have. Come and be Lord of my life. In Jesus' name. The worship team is going to lead us through a song that, again, some of you are familiar with. The words will be on the screen here in a moment, but again, it's called Graves in a Garden, and it's looking at how God brings life out of that which was lifeless. He, he mends that which was broken. He makes a way where there seemed to be no way. And for some of you this morning when you came in, that's how you felt. You felt there was no way. You felt broken. You, you felt like you, you, you were looking for something you didn't know, and that's why you're here today. This morning, I want to encourage you, if you'd like to come forward and receive prayer, I'll be up here to pray with you this morning. But I also want to just encourage, as a congregation, let us stand up and worship the Lord as we celebrate this morning the life that comes through Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord. Oh, Father, we thank you that we know that there's a place we can find fulfillment. There's a place that we can satisfy that longing that we have for something greater than ourselves, a longing that we have to know the one who created us, the one who desires to have a relationship with us. And we thank you for that, Lord. And Father, we thank you that the place that we find that fulfillment, the place we find that satisfaction is not through something this world can offer. It's not through something that we look at and it appears to be full. But Lord, actually, rather, it was through an empty grave that we find fulfillment. That God, just as many times you work in a way that's countercultural to all things, the idea of finding fulfillment in that which is empty is something that the world has a hard time understanding. But Lord, we understand that it's through the empty tomb that we find fulfillment and wholeness in our lives because you were risen from the dead. And God, you are alive and active in our lives today. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you, Father, that we can celebrate the resurrection Sunday today and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Because, God, you are worthy, you are holy, and we praise you, Lord. We thank you, Father. God, I just pray now as, as we head out to go with our family and friends to celebrate the resurrection Sunday today as we gather together, Lord, I just pray that we would gather together with the right mindset, Lord, with the right idea and celebrating and remembering what today is all about. Yes, it's about the fellowship of the body. It's about fellowshipping with family, but Lord, ultimately, it is about you and what you did through your son, Jesus Christ. And putting him upon the cross on Friday and then raising him back to life on Sunday. And so, Lord, I pray for our conversations that take place. I pray you'd help us, Lord, to speak truth. God, give us opportunities to speak life into areas where it's dead. God, that you would bring about a garden out of a graveyard. And Lord, we thank you that through you, we can go from feeling hopeless to feeling hope-filled because of you and who you are. And so Lord, I pray you just be with us as we go now. We ask all these things in